Hello and welcome to the fourth video of the video um, series that goes along with the introduction to our workshop series run by Kirimar Burkhoff Statistics Unit. Um, the introduction to our workshops are a hands-on series of workshops um, that has a large book with mat material attached to it. And we're also doing these videos um, just to help with the workshops and also for people who are just using the booklet to try and learn R, um, the videos can be a little bit useful. Um, the statistics unit um, consults to Kiwama, Berghofer, Metro North and MARTA researchers. Um, we offer lots of different services and there are contacts. Hopefully before this video, you've either come to the workshops see, or seen the other videos. This isn't necessarily the greatest video to start with, um, especially if you haven't um, had any experience with R before. The earlier videos go over the more basic skills. Um, if you are seeing this video, you can probably assume you've got r, &R Studio on your computer. Um, for this video, we're going to be using the wk2 underscore 11 data cleaning .csv file for our data set, and we will be using the string r package. So hopefully you've run the code for install.packages um, bracket quotation string r, because we'll be using some functions from that package later on. So this video is on data preparation and handling. Um, so it's going to be some basic skills of once you've called the data set into R, how to check to see if there are any errors in it, how to clean the data, how to prepare it for analysis. Um, there's lots of different things we could have put in this video and in this section of the booklet in the workshops, but we're just focusing on some of the more basic things, focusing on how to use the different skills we've learned before and how to use some new skills just to work with the data in R and get it ready for what we want to do. Um, so by no means is this um, comprehensive. There's many more skills out there that you can learn, but this is a good fresh, um, a good taste for everything. So with that .csv file, make sure you have that saved and wait, you make sure you know where it is saved because the location of the folder where it's saved is what you're going to want to set your working directory as. Um, so you'll want to get the pathway to that folder where the file is saved and set that as your working directory using setwd function. And you'll also, you'll also at some point later need to use the library function to get the string R package into our session. So I'm going to jump across now to my R Studio session. So once we're in our studio and I've got my working directory set, I've already used the read.csv function to call in the CSV file. So that's read.csv, then in brackets, the file name, including the extension in quotation marks. Um, if I had just used the read.csv function, all the data would have been printed to the console. But instead, because I want to use the data, I've assigned it to the object my data. So if you want to follow along with me, it might be easiest if you also call your data set my data, um, or lowercase, because that way your code will match mine and it'll match the book. Um, but yes, yeah, so once you've set the working directory and you use the read.csv function, you, you should have a my data object in your environment. And now we're just going to go through some basic things for data cleaning and preparation. So we've got this data set, and in the booklet, we have a data dictionary, so we can quickly look at that. So we have this fictional data set, which looked at survival in patients who had heart disease, receiving one or two different surgeries, procedures. They've got some other um, information and comorbidities recorded. And we can see here in this table, what each variable is, what it means, and the expected values for it. So we've got the variable patient, which is a unique ID for each case. And it tells us that there's 30 patients in total. So we should expect um, our object to have 30 rows. We've got a procedure, um, which tells us which is the procedure the patient had. And we can see here that it's been coded as one or two, the two different procedures. We have the variable survival time, um, notice how all the variable names don't have spaces because we know that's a very um, tricky thing to have in variables. Most packages don't allow that. So all the variable names have underscores. Um, and even though 
and our labels also tell us a bit more information about the variable. So survival time and tells us that the length of survival since surgery and the values column we can see that it's recorded in years and the maximum number of years is five years. So it may be, um, so that might be a definition of who's been collected for the study um, and however this fictional study was um, conducted. The variable age is the age at surgery. And we can see in the values that there was an exclusion criteria. So we were the fictional data set excluded those who are greater, older than 90 years of age. And there's a code there for missing values. So if it's triple nine, it means the person making this data set looked for the data for the age, but it wasn't available. And so rather than just assuming that perhaps someone accidentally deleted it, triple nine is there saying, yes, we know this is missing. We have a gender variable, which has been coded lowercase m for male and lowercase f for female. We have the number of prior heart conditions, um, which we can see there is recorded as a number. And their triple nine also means unknown or unavailable. We have kidney disease, which is yes and no. And we have date of death, and it tells us how it's recorded date of death, because that's a very important thing if you're recording dates in a data set. Um, if you haven't used a data dictionary like this or something similar to this before, I'd encourage you to do it in the future. It's a great way of for yourself keeping track of the variables and information in your data set. If you have to leave the data set and come back in a couple months, or if you end up handing the data to someone else, and they'll very much appreciate understanding in detail how all the variables are constructed and what they all mean. Anyway, let's jump back my R Studio session. So we can see that the data is there in our environment. Um, but the first thing you do once you've got a data in your R session is you're just going to want to look at it to see what you have, to see what the data looks like, see if it's been called incorrectly. So there's lots of different ways you can do that. Excuse me for one second. <laughs> lots of different ways you can do that. Um, and in a data set this small, those 30 observations of eight variables, um, a lot of these things that I show you may appear a bit redundant. Um, but just one method will, would work fine. But I'm going to show you a couple of different ways um, which might work for different size data sets as well. Um, so obviously, the first thing we can do is go over to our environment here and just double click on my data. And the data set pops up here next to the script file. And so I can just scroll down and see all the data there. Now for a data set of this size, this is very easy to do. You can quite easily scroll through everything. Um, of course, some larger data sets, this may be more tricky if you have hundreds and hundreds of variables, hundreds and hundreds of rows. Um, this may not be the most practical way to do it. And so we can look at some functions that might help us just get a feel for our data. So we looked at in the last video, there's the head function. So this is head and then just the object in there. And if I control enter on that bit of code, I can see the first six lines of the data set printed to my console. So I can see all the different values there. And similarly, there's the tail function, which give me the last six. So I can get a bit of an idea of what the values in each variable are and what's there. Um, so I can see that and can see that it's all called, called incorrectly, but sometimes another thing I want to do is look at what type of variables I have in my data set. So one way to do that is to go up here to environment and click on the blue arrow and that'll drop down all the variables in that object um, and give me the name, the type of variable and the first few values in that variable. Um, so depending on exactly which function you use to call in your data and also which version of functions or perhaps your storage system, there might be some changes in defaults here in terms of whether a number was read, uh, sorry, a variable was read as a numeric type or integer type, and whether some variables were read in as character or factor types. Um, so there may be some differences to what you see or maybe what's in the book, but I'll show you what's coming up on my screen. So when I click down here, I can see the names of all the different variables. 
and I can see the type. So int means integer, so patient, procedure, survival time and age are all integer type variables. And I can see the first few values in a lot of them. Gender is a factor variable, which we talked about in a previous video with six levels. Number of prior heart conditions is integer. Kidney disease is a factor with five levels and date of death is a factor with 30 levels. So I can see that there just by dropping down. If I had more variables, I could scroll through them. Um, another way I can do, get the very similar information is with this str function. So I can just put my cursor there, control enter. And str is a more general function that tells you the structure and the type of any object you put in as an input to the str function. So it's telling me that the str, that my data, the my data object is a data frame has 30 observations of eight variables. Um, it tells me all the different variable names there. And then again, what type of um, variable they are and the first few values. So very similar information. Just depends whether you want it in the environment window or the console. Um, both are available to you. It depends what it's ever easier for you to work with. Notice the dollar sign here, that'll come up very soon. The dollar sign is how we access variables in a data frame. So rather than having just to call the data frame all the time, we can go my data dollar sign. And thankfully, um, our studio will give you a pop-up option for all the different variables in my data. So my data dollar sign patient pulls out just the vector of patient values or I can look at the gender ones there. So the dollar sign will access just a specific variable from a data set, which we'll be using very soon to talk a bit more about. So this is normally the point in the workshop where we've seen that the data set's pulled in, we've looked at the data dictionary to tell us what the variables are and what values they're meant to take. And I start polling the audience of, okay, we should make sure our data is clean, there's no errors, what type of things we can do. Obviously, I can't really get any call and responses here, so I'm just going to go through all the different things we can do. Um, so one of the first things we can do is check the data errors. Um, and there's lots of different ways you can do this. So it's really up to you about how you want to use your different R skills. Um, I will go show you some very generic ways, and then we'll look at some other ways as well. So one of the best things you can ever have is this summary function. Summary, the summary function has lots of different roles in different areas in R. Um, but if we did summary on just a, um, a data frame like this, what it does is it gives us, for numeric and integer type values, it'll give us a five number summary. So we can see here for survival time, um, that it's given us the five number summary, so the minimum, the median, the maximum, and the first and third quartile, as well as the mean. So this can be a way to quickly describe the data in that variable and to see if that's what it's expected. So we were told in the data dictionary that it should be um, survival time in years with a maximum of five years. So values like one, three, four are be expected. Um, a value of 20 here is unexpected. So it can tell us straight away that there's a maximum that is bigger than what we expect. Um, you can see a similar thing here for age. Age was in years. Um, so we've got minimum and median. Third quarter will look fairly reasonable. A mean age of 118 looks a bit strange, but that can be explained by this maximum of 999. So that's obviously not a correct age, but we know why it's there. So we can deal with that later and try and correct it again. We can also see that there's an NA there as well that shouldn't be there because we should have already created all our missings as 999. Um, for character and factor variables, summary gives us a quick frequency tabulation. So we can see here for kidney disease, it's looked at all the different versions of yes, whether it's capitalized or not capitalized and told us how many of each of them there are. So it can be a quick way to see how many different um, specific or, or unique words or sentences or just character strings are in that character or factor variable. 
Um, but if there's too many, such as here with date of death, it'll just give you, say, the first six and tell you how many others there are. We can also use summary on a specific variable. So say we look at gender, can use summary of my data dollar sign gender. And rather than having it in this vertical way, it also has it across this way. And that'll generally not cut it off at six. It'll give you a bit more. Um, another alternative to using summary on character or factor variables is to use the table function. So table will work, will treat all data like a um, categorical, a categorical variable. So if we used summary on a, on a numeric or integer variable before, it gave us a summary. Let's say we want to know how many specific different values there are, or we know that stuff like procedure is actually a categorical variable and we've just coded it, table will treat it as a categorical variable and tell us how much of each one there is. So stuff like summary and table can be a good way to get a quick brief overview of the different variables you have in your data set. So as well as looking at minimums and maximums and other um, summary statistics for each variable, we can use visualization to assess if the distribution of the variable is as we expect. So this can be where some of our basic plot functions that we looked at in previous videos can come in handy. So for number of prior heart conditions, if we look back at our data dictionary, number of prior heart conditions was zero, one, and two, so numbers. You can't have half a prior heart condition, so they're all in integer numbers, which could be sort of as integer or numeric in R, and triple nine means unknown. So if we come back here, let's look at a histogram of the number of prior heart conditions. So the function hist will make a really quick histogram. And we can see here that most of the, hist the number of prior heart conditions are in the zero to two number. We've got some that are greater than two. But we also seem to have a number way up here, greater than eight, so in the eight to 10 range, which could be possible, but it looks like an outlier there in the distribution. Um, similar to histogram, we could use box plot, just to make a really quick visualization of the distribution. And we can see, yep, all the data seems to be from zero to three, and we just have one outlier up here at 10. Now, once we've identified that there is an outlier in the data set, one thing we want to do is we want to check whether that's a typo or an actual value. Um, before we can go checking through charts again to see if that value is correct or to see if it's a typo, um, we need to identify which case it belongs to. And there's a number of different ways we could do this. Of course, we could just jump into my data here and scroll through till we find the row that has the 10 prior heart conditions, which in this case is row 20 or patient 20. Um, but if we had a very large data set and we didn't know how to do that, I'm sorry, did not know we didn't know how to do that, but that it wouldn't be feasible to scroll through hundreds of or thousands of cases to find the outliers. Um, we can use our logic to identify, sorry, logic as in our programming log, logic to find the cases that match those outliers. So remember from previous videos, um, we can use our logic here in the square brackets to identify specific elements of a vector or a data frame, in this case, a vector. So we're looking at the my data patient vector, which is the vector of unique identifiers going from one to 30. And then here is a logical statement that will give false when the number of prior heart conditions is eight or lower, and true when the number of prior heart conditions is greater than eight. So if we just look at what this code inside the square brackets is doing, its output is a vector of trues and falses, so outcomes of a logical statement. And the element in the patient vector that matches the true in this logical vector will be output to the screen when we run this line of code. So this is telling us that the patient identifier that matches the number of prior heart conditions being greater than eight is patient ID 20, which is what we saw in the data set when we looked at it. Um, but this is another way of doing it. 
So obviously greater than eight is a very general, general rule. We know that the value is 10. We can see that in the box plot. So we could do the exact same thing with equivalent to 10. Um, but the, the greater than eight um, example is there because sometimes you won't have an integer variable like we have here. You might have a numeric variable and you may not know exactly the values you're looking for. So greater than eight to use this as an example might be, okay, all our distribution is down here at a very low amount. Um, eight is a clear cutoff between the outlier and the rest of the distribution. So we can just look at all the values greater than that. There's lots of different ways we can use our skills of logic and coding um, to get information that we want. Um, so you do what you do whatever works best for you in the situation that you're in at the time when you're working with your own data. Um, but I want to try and show you a few different ways you can do that and combine different skills in R. Okay. Obviously, once we've identified this outlier, we'd go through the chart, we'd check patient ID 20 to see if 10 was correct, or if it was meant to be one, or if it was meant to be zero, or if it was meant to be a different number completely. Um, and then we can move on to check something else. Next thing we're going to check for is for duplicates. So there's a lot of situations where a variable shouldn't have duplicate values. For example, the patient ID in this data set should not have duplicate values because each um, value is meant to identify a unique patient and identify a unique row in our data set. So there shouldn't be any duplicates. And this is something we should always check when we call in a data set. Thankfully, we've got this function duplicated. So duplicated will take a vector input and give true and false based on if there are duplicates in there. So if I run duplicated, it gives me a vector of false and trues where each false or true matches to an element in the patient vector. See, there's lots of falses, meaning that there aren't any duplications, but there is one true here, meaning that that does match, that the, or that there is a duplicated value inside patient. Notice here how there's only one true, because um, logically, if there is a, a duplicated value, there'd be two occurrences of that value in the data set. Um, so with duplicated, it will give a false to the first time that value occurs in the vector, and then a true from then onwards. So this true matches the second time that that duplicated value appears in the vector, starting from the first element going onwards. Um, true is the, the outcome of duplicated will be true if the, that element has appeared in the vector before. Now, obviously, the output here of duplicated is fairly small. We can fairly quickly scan all these and see that there's a true. Um, but if your vector is very large, it might be very difficult to scan through all of them. So this is when we can use the function any. The any function we've seen in previous videos. The any function will take a vector of logical values and output true if there are any true values in that vector and false if they are all falses. So by doing any and then duplicate it on a vector, it basically tells you if there is at all any duplicated values within that vector or if there isn't. Um, so obviously now we've got, got to try and figure out which patient has a duplicated value. So we're going to be looking at the my data patient because that's the values you want to check for. And we're going to put the duplicated function output into the square brackets. So that was that logical vector here. And so the true values that we're going to put in, when we put this logical vector into the square brackets, this true value is going to match up with one of the duplicated values. So it will tell us which patient ID is duplicated. So if I run that line of code, and it tells me that patient ID 21 has been duplicated. Of course, because I've got a small data set, I can quickly look at that and see look here. Yeah, patient ID 21 is there twice. We don't have a patient ID 22, so probably one of these is meant to be patient ID 22. If we didn't have a small data set, um, or if we wanted to do it without having to look through the data, say for example that the duplicates aren't next to each other, 
what we can do is we can call, is we can extract the rows of my data that match up with my the patient variable being 21. So we're going to get, we're not looking for us just a vector here, we're going to get the whole rows of the my data object. So this is in square brackets, there'll be a comma with before the comma matching to rows and after the comma matching columns. There's nothing after the columns because we're trying to get all the columns out. So we're making the logical vector of my data dollar sign patient is equivalent to 21. So it'll be true when patient is 21 and false when it isn't. And the output of that is the two rows that had a patient ID of 21. And it's good to look at all the rows that match duplicates because you want to see, is it a duplicate of the complete row? So is the row just in there twice? Or has it been that the patient ID is in there twice? And we can see here that from all the other variables that it looks like they're different in every other way. So it just looks like patient um, ID is in there twice. And like we saw before, there isn't a 22. So it's likely that one of these is meant to be patient ID 22. This would be something you'd go back and check the charts for to make sure and see which one is correct. Okay. Now, once we've started to find some errors and inconsistencies, how do we fix them? Obviously, there's a couple of different ways you could do this. If your data set is in an Excel file or a CSV file, you can always change the um, errors and inconsistencies there. Um, so you can save a new version of the Excel or CSV file, fix up any mistakes you see, and then call it into R again. Or you can fix within R. Um, either way is up to you. I do recommend keeping a master file of the original data, um, just in case you accidentally make a change that you shouldn't have made, you can see what was originally there. Um, so what we're first gonna look at is when we see a lot of typos or inconsistencies in recordings of character values. So remember when we looked at the gender values, the my gender variable, it was a factor variable and it had six different levels. There was lowercase m, lowercase f, capital F, fm, lowercase m, and capital M, which we can see from our data dictionary. Most of them shouldn't be there. That should just be a lowercase m and a lowercase f. So there's a number of values there um, that shouldn't be there. So the capital F and M shouldn't be there because it should be all in lowercase. We seem to have two lowercase m's, so I'll have to look into that. It's probably just because there's a space there that shouldn't be there, because I will call in spaces and treat it as just a blank character. And then we've got that fm there that is likely a typo, um, because it isn't one of the two values um, that our data dictionary says we can have. Um, so it's likely that's just a typo there, and we'll have to identify that and fix it. Another way to identify where um, all the different values in that variable is, is we can use the unique function. Um, so obviously we can't see with levels down here what some of the differences are, say between the, lower, the two lowercase m's, whereas unique will be able to tell us that. So I'm gonna use unique, I'm also gonna use as character. We'll talk a bit more about these types of functions later. Basically it just turns the variable from a fact variable to a character variable. If we use unique on that output, we get all the different unique values that is in that variable at the moment. So we've seen the lowercase f, we see here that there's a value that is space m. So this is where that difference between these two are coming from. There's a space m and an m, capital F, capital M, and fm. So how do we fix all these different inconsistencies? Well, there's one function we can use, which is str underscore trim. This comes from the string R package. Um, so if you haven't already, make sure you run the function library with string R, just so make sure that's in your session. Um, remember, when you use library, you don't need quotation marks, but when you use install packages, you do. Um, but we can look at the str trim. So in fact, we'll quickly put that in a help window here. 
So SCR trim, it trims the white space from a string. So from the start and end of a string or a character value, it takes the white spaces or the blank spaces that are on either side off. So we can see here, so that there's at least one value here that has a space M as a value. The output of SCR trim, str trim with the my data dollar sign gender variable going in there is this vector of character values where there are no values of space M. Um, the str trim outputs a character vector. So even if you put in a factor vector or a factor variable, it will output a string. Um, and we can see here that everything is a character and there are no spaces on either side. Now, just because we've used the str trim function doesn't mean we've changed the variable in our data set. Um, all I've done so far is take the gender variable, put it into the function and output um, the result to the console. I haven't changed my object yet. If I want to change my variable, I have to assign the output back to the variable or alternatively make a new variable. Um, because that's the only way to update the data set that I'm using. A function won't up, functions like these won't update the data set, um, the data frame. We need to assign that output from that function back to the object. The way we're doing it here is we're overriding or creating that variable again. So the new version of gender will be the output from str trim. Another way you can do this is to make new versions of the variable. That way you always have the original variable there. There's a lot to be said for that method because um, it keeps both the record of what the original data was and all the new versions. Um, do recommend that in some cases, but we're not, we are not doing that here. So to run this line of code, just my cursor there, or I could highlight it, control enter. It doesn't print to the screen this time because the output isn't going to the console. It's going into the object. And I can see here in my environment window that gender is now a character variable inside the object. Now, we've removed the instance where there was a space, um, but we still have a mixture of capitals and lowercase. So there is the function to lower, which will turn all of the characters in that character variable to lowercase. So to lower, we've got a vector there of gender variables, the gender values, I'm sorry. And we can see here that there's all these Fs and Ms that are now lowercase, as opposed to when some of them were uppercase before. Now again, the to lower function hasn't changed my data set yet. It's just showing me what the new version of the data would be. If I want to keep that data into my object, I've got to assign it into the variable there. There is also a version of the to upper function of that makes it uppercase, which is to upper. So this is what kidney disease looks like, the kidney disease um, variable of yes, no, and to upper would make them all capitals. Um, we can see here there's all sorts of other issues that this variable has. We're not gonna actually look at that. We've already shown how to find that how to find those things. We're just looking at different examples of where you can look for issues with the data. But yeah, two upper also exists there if you want everything in capitals. Another thing that while we're here might be useful to do is to force um, all the values in a variable to be the same size if we're looking at character variables, character values in a variable. So for example, with patient ID, um, we've got everything in numbers there from one up to 30. And if we started to treat that variable as character, it would might treat those numbers in alphabetical order, meaning it would go 1, 10, 11, through the teens, and then 2, 20, um, that type of situation. Um, if we're not treating it as a number, but treating it as a character instead. So one thing we might want to do, and this is just an example where this might be used, um, is use this function strpad. That pads out values um, with characters to make them all the same size. 
So what we can do here is we can put in the patient. So if I just look at what patient looks like currently. We can see here there's one, two, three, et cetera, up to 30. And what if instead we wanted to turn these numbers into characters that all have a width of two characters. And to do that, we're gonna to add to the left side um, a zero, which is gonna pad the left side. So the output of that is a character vector that has a zero added to the left side so that every value is at least two spaces wide. Again, this might not be useful to you, you might never use this. This is a way you can work with things in R and prepare them for what you might want. Um, now let's look at other things. We'll go back to our gender variable now. We have our gender variable that is all lowercase now. We remove the spaces, but we still have that weird value of fm. Now, because that's not one of the values in our data dictionary that we're accepting, we have to go through and check against the case report or chart as to what the value is. Um, so we might go that back to the chart and find out that it was meant to be an F, but it was just a typo that we have F and M there. So the value of FM. So how do we fix that? So what we can do is we can use our logic to identify where the FM is, which is fairly easy to do because we can just go my data gender equivalent to lowercase fm as a character, which gives a logical vector that's true when that's the case. And if we do that with gender, as you could expect, the output of that is fm. So putting that logical um, vector in square brackets means we're only looking at the part of gender that is fm. And because we're only looking at that part now, we can replace just that part of my data gender with f by over assigning um, the value f to gender just in that place. So if I run this line of code, I can now see what my gender, what the gender variable looks like. I can see there's no mfs, and I can check that with the unique function. I can see now that there's only two different values. So that's how you change specific values in a vector. So we're not obviously gonna re replace the entire vector when we do this, because um, we only need to assign f to one value. So rather than assign the entire vector, we use the logic to say which parts of gender are being assigned that value. Um, this is quite a common structure of how we do things. We're only looking at changing part of the vector. You can use the vector, the logical condition, assign it the new value. Um, changing specific values can be risky when you're using logic because you might change more than you expected. So if, for example, there are multiple cases of FM in there and we hadn't quite realized that, what we've essentially just done is changed all instances of FM to F. If instead there had been another FM in there, that should have been changed to an M. We've now made them both F and we have, don't have a record in our data set which one is meant of the other FM um, to be able to change it to male or M. Um, so it's just a thing to be careful for and to make sure you're always changing only what you want to change and to check that you've changed the right thing, which you should do whatever software package you're using. Okay. The next thing we're going to look at is variable type conversion. So in previous videos and workshops, we've talked about the different types of data and different types of variables. Um, where there's numeric, integer, character, logical, factor. And we've also talked about how different functions of reading in files will give, make them different types. Also, the same data can be stored in different types. We might want it stored in different ways and change it, um, or we might want to change it to a specific type for a specific purpose. Um, so this is what we convert between different variable types. So for example, we've got my data gender here, which is a character va um, variable, but we might want to store that as a factor. A factor being a variable that has the variable stored in 
integers, so ones and twos, and then another vector that's associated with it saying what each of the ones and twos are. Um, there's a really quick way to do this, which is the as factor variable. Now there's lots of different as dot type functions, which are meant to be really quick ways to convert um, vari variables between the different data types. Um, it, it makes a lot of assumptions and assumes everything's already set up really well to change. So I'm gonna put my cursor here, control enter on that line. And I can see now, Um, that it is now a factor variable with the levels F and M. And if I look up here in my environment for gender, I can see that gender is a factor with two levels. The two levels are F and M. And these integers here, the ones and twos, they're the, they're, that is how R is storing it. So it's storing it as one, two, one, 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 two, etc but then it's storing in a separate vector that one is F and two is M. So that's how a factor works and it can be easier to work with factors when it's like this. Now, another way factors might appear is, and you may want to use factors, is if you've already stored your data categorically um, with codes. So for example, in our data set, the procedure variable if we look back in our data dictionary, the procedure variable is what procedure the patient had, where one is angioplasty and two is bypass. Um, so that's how it's stored in the data set, except R doesn't know what those numbers stand for yet. It just knows that it's a variable of ones and twos. So if we look at the procedure variable with my data dollar sign procedure, we can see it's vectors of ones and twos. And we want to turn that variable into a factor variable because it will store the ones and twos as codes, but it will also then keep record of what the ones and twos mean. Um, so we can do this with the factor function. So as factor is meant to be a really quick way of converting between types, factor gives you a little bit more control. So the inputs to factor, I can put it if you're, anytime you're dealing with a function you don't use often, or even if you just want to check how things work, is you put it in the help file um, search bar and see the documentation for it, and you can see all the things that you're going to need. Um, so the first thing we're going to need is the character vector or other type of vector that we're going to want to turn into a factor. If you look here, you can see that um, in the factor function, x is that first um, argument of the function, which is what you're going to want to turn in, the data you want to turn into a factor. You can also see that it automatically turns it all to character anyway. Um, so there's always a bit of a jump between numeric to factor that it has to go through character first, um, but the factor function does that for you. So x is the um, argument of the data, which is the, in our case the procedure um, variable. Next is levels. So levels is the um, what the unique values that X has taken. So X is stored as ones and twos. So levels argument is a vector of one and two because that's the different values that X, the procedure variable can take. And then labels is the vector that matches it. Um, now, if we didn't include labels, the labels would just match what the level is, it would just match one and two. Um, but we want to change what the labels for the different values are because we want to record that. So we want to be able to say um, that one is angioplasty and two is bypass. Levels and labels has to be the same size, but we can use these inputs to be able to say that one and two are the two different values that procedure can take and they match up with angioplasty and bypass. If we didn't include levels and labels, I would be able to figure out, okay, what are all the unique values in the procedure? And we'll just call them what it's already been called. Um, but with the fact variable, we can give it a lot of control to be able to say, yep, this is exactly how we want it. So I'll run that kind of code. And I can see up here that already that procedure has changed to a factor with two levels in this environment tab. 
And if I run procedure, I can see that it's now a factor variable with two levels. And the, la the labels that we gave it are what shows up in the console. So even though procedure is stored as a factor, which means that it's stored in ones and twos still, whenever we access it now, the labels will, uh, will be what we see. Um, of course, we can notice something's wrong here. We've got an NA, which matches a zero that was previously in there. This is, of course, something that we'd normally check first before we do the factor. Um, but we can, the reason I haven't done it yet is because I wanted to show that if you don't, if you're doing a factor manually by making the levels and labels, if you don't include any values in levels, um, and then obviously then don't have a matching label, it won't be in your resulting factor output in your resulting factor vector or factor variable. Um, because it didn't match anything in levels, it will just become NA, which is almost exactly what we want here because we know that the zero is an error. Well, because it's not in the data dictionary, we'd go back and check it and then we'd change that NA. Okay, so I mentioned briefly just before that um, there can be all sorts of issues going from numeric to factor. Um, so to do that, you have to go through character. So I'm just going to do something here that we normally wouldn't do. I'm going to turn age into a factor. Age is now a factor with 21 levels. I'm using as factor. And as factor did all sorts of things to do that. Um, quite often, a numeric variable like age will might be imported in incorrectly as a factor or as a character because of issues with what was stored in the data set. So if you have spaces, um, if you accidentally hit the space bar when you're entering numbers, or if someone adds text into a variable that is meant to be just numbers, um, the import function may consider, because because you can't have blank text or text in a numeric variable, I will then treat that either as a character vector or as a factor variable. Um, that, so that's quite common if you don't have just numbers in your variable. And so how you convert it back to um, numer a, a numeric variable um, can depend on the situation. Um, in this case, because we know they are all numbers in there, it's just we're forced to be a factor. We'll look at how we get back to numeric. Because unlike as factor where it handles everything really quickly, you can't jump straight from factor back to numeric because all the new, all the as numeric function will do is it will go into the part of the factor that stores everything as an integer. So as it's storing at one, two, and three, and it will just pull the, that bit out because that's the numeric part. Um, and it will lose what the labels are, the labels being the actual ages. So to convert something from factor to numeric and get the correct information, what you have to do is go through as character first. So we've got my data age here, where every, there's the different levels. These are all, all these are stored as ones, twos, and threes. Um, and these are the labels that match it. If we get as character, that turns them all just straight into a character. It turns what the labels are into a character. And then from there, we can turn that into a numeric, into a numeric variable. And this is numeric again. Whereas if we had just gone straight to as numeric, these aren't the actual ages, these are the um, integer indices that relate to which level each value is. So that's obviously not what we want. Um, and this is a very common thing that people sometimes get when they're trying to move, um, change things around. So what you're always gonna to wanna to do if you're going from factor to numeric is you go as numeric bracket as character bracket variable. That corrects it. 
Um, this is why it's always good when you are changing between types to check things are changing as you expect. Um, that's just something you should do no matter what software you're using. Always check that when you change your data that it's changing as you expect it. Um, as we will have noticed, there is a triple nine in the data set, meaning that value is meant to be missing. Um, there is also another missing in there as well. There is that NA. So two different situations here. For that NA first, you'd want to go back and check to see what that age is meant to be. Um, if it is indeed missing, it's fine. We can leave it as NA there. Um, but it, if it wasn't recorded as triple nine in the data set, it probably means that um, we didn't purposely know it was missing beforehand. So we should go check to see if it is missing or if we can actually get the age. Um, if we can get the age, we'll change it. If not, we can leave it as an A. This triple nine, because we want to make that a missing data um, value in our variable, we're going to turn triple nine into an NA. So we've got my data, similar to what we did before with FM. We've got my data dollar sign age, square bracket, my dollar dollar sign age, equivalent to triple nine, is now being replaced as NA. So now there is no triple nine in the data set. It's NA, or for age at least. Um, notice we do still have this 524 here. That's another thing that would spot and would go in through and check to see what it is. Um, this fictional data set has been used in lots of different workshops over the years, so there's more issues in it than I'm addressing in this video right now. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at categorizing a continuous variable. So you might have a continuous variable like age, where um, the age can range from you know 50s to 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, but in your analysis, you may not want to use it as a continuous variable. You might want to break it up into groups um, and use it as a categorical variable. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do this. There's a really manual, straightforward way, which is you can make a variable and assign it values based on logic. So what we've got here is we're going to make this variable age cat. And then we've got our square brackets here. With my data dollar sign age less than 70. So that's going to be a logical output of trues and falses when, and some NAs when the age is NA, because if a value of NA is used in a logical statement, it will always just give up NA. Um, so we're making this age cat variable. Unlike some other programming languages, if you've used other programming languages, um, you don't have to create the variable first. In some other languages you do, not all of them. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make this age cat variable and when age is less than 70, so when these values here are true, age cat is gonna be assigned a value of less than 70 as a character. I'm gonna run that line of code. I'm going to check out my data set up here in the viewer. And I can see here that when age is less than 70, there is a character here of less than 70. So 62, 59, 61 here has less than 70. And then there's also NAs otherwise. NA is there because we haven't given those specific rows any values. So NA is just the default value. NA means there's nothing there. Okay, then to replace the rest of them, we can use in square brackets, my data dollar sign age is greater than or equal to 70. We have to include the equal then, equal to part of it. Otherwise, when age is 70, um, it won't get anything given to it. So I'm gonna run this line of code. And then I can see what age cap looks like. So it's a combination of 70 plus and less than 70 with the two NAs matching the NAs in age. So that's a very manual way of doing it. You're very much in control of what you're doing there and you can might make very specific conditions um, for your um, logic in there. So your logic might be based on a couple of variables. We've talked when we talk about logic about and and or. So you, you can make very specific conditions on how to make your groups there. Um, 
but you do have to be a bit more careful there because you are doing everything manually. You have to check to make sure everything's happening as you want it to happen. Another simple way to do this is with the cut function. Um, so I'm gonna make a different variable here, age underscore cut. So the cut function takes that continuous variable and then it divides it up according to the input to the breaks argument. So the breaks argument are the values that define each boundary of the groups you wanna make out of the continuous variable. So previously in age cat, we divided it by 70, so less than 70 and 70 plus. This time we're gonna make a group um, of less than 60 and 60 to less than 70 and then 70 and above because we can quite easily make a number of groups here. What we need to remember with the breaks variable is that not, we don't just need inputs into this vector given to breaks of where the breaks in the continuous variable are going to be. We also need values for the outside of each of the um, groups at the top and bottom. So the less than 60 group, we can make the break at 60, but we also need a value less than 60 for all the values less than 60 to be in. So all the values in their 50s, um, not only do they have to be less than 60, they also have to be greater than zero. Um, so we can use any small number there um, to fit what we need, but we do need a value on the other side of the extreme ends. That's why we have zero and 100, because they're the practical extreme values, I guess, for age. And we also know that there are no ages 100 or more. When we looked at our age, we have also this um, argument, right equals false, which I'll talk about in a second. So the cut function is gonna divide, make an output based on what the values in age and also the other arguments. I'm gonna assign that output to the age underscore cut function. I'm gonna run that and then we'll look at my data set. I can see here age cut here, where for the value 86, it's been given the 70 to 100 category. Um, for the age 62, it's the 60 to 70 category. For the age 59, it's the zero to 60 category. Um, of course, I could have used a different number than zero. I could have used a different number than 100, um, but I just needed those two extremes there as well. So the cut function can divide a continuous variable up into many groups. Um, the right equals false is to be on which side of the category the break point goes. So with right equals false, um, the 60 goes to the left side, and see the 60, 70, and 100 go to the left side of the break, of the, the chunk that we're getting out of the cut function. So our groups are 0 to 59, and then 60 to 69, because 60 is not on the right side, it's on the left side. So 60 to 69, and 70 um, to less than 100. If we had made it right equals true, the categories would be 0 to 60 rather than 0 to 59, because 60 is on the right side of the group. Um, that's just a thing to be aware of if you decide to use the cut function. Um, and likewise, we can see here um, that there are NAs here when we had NAs in age. Notice up here as well, when, when we used 100 as the cutoff point for the top group, the age of 524, which we haven't corrected yet because I wasn't gonna do that in this video, hasn't been given a value. Whereas when we were just using the logic, it was given a value. So this is one of those situations where you sh even when you create variables that make sense in your head, that you're like, yep, this code should do exactly this, and this is exactly what I want, it is always good to check it's done exactly what you want. Which is again, true of all software packages, you should always check that everything is happening how you expect it to happen. Um, while we're here looking at the data viewer, I'm just gonna go over a couple of things that are useful here for you to look at. Um, so if we hover over each of the variable names, it tells us a bit of information about it. Um, so you can see here that patient is column one. This can be really useful if we have to start referencing columns by their number um, rather than name. So if you say hover over gender, you can see that's column five. So if you want to extract the fifth column, you'll extract the gender column. Um, this hovering also tells us what type of variable it is. So age is numeric with that range and gender is factor with two levels. 
number of prior heart conditions is numeric with a range of zero to 10. So it gives us all sorts of information there. Sometimes it's not exactly accurate because it says here for age zero to 600. So it's not exactly accurate, um, but it can still give us a good idea, um, especially of what type it is and how many levels might be in there. Um, with this, we can also resort the variable for our viewing. So currently the data is stored in um, patient order, so one to 30, but we could um, resort the data to be in ascending age. So just by clicking on those arrows next to the variable, um, I've now sorted the data, my viewing by that variable. Now this sorting doesn't change your data set. It's not resorting how the data is stored. It's just sorting how you're viewing it. So that can be really useful um, if you just want to look at the, um, say the, in this case, the youngest patients in the data set, um, or alternatively the oldest. Um, so you can do that without changing your actual data sets. This won't cause any changes to the data set. It's just changing how you're seeing it. So likewise, we could change it to survival time and sort based on the survival time so we can see all the patients that just have a one for survival time then a two. And this isn't changing the order of the data set, just how we view it. Um, another thing we can do here is filter. So if you can click on this filter here, this little extra bit drops down here and we can filter what we're seeing. So if I click here, because it's a factor, it already tells me what I can filter by. So I can click bypass and just see all the bypass variables. And then I can also sort by age while filtering by bypass. I could then sort by gender, or I could filter by gender to be just the females that have been given bypass sorted by age. These are little things you can use in however you want to use them. Um, you can then cancel the filters. Um, so this, these little tricks and skills can help you work with your data to, um, to get the best out of it, to see how you want to sort it. Um, if you close that data viewer and then go back into it, it hasn't changed the data set in any way. It hasn't gotten rid of anything we filtered out. It hasn't changed the order of the data. Um, how you deal with it here in the viewer is just how you're viewing it at the time, um, which can be really useful if you're searching through the data set for something and you and code is not maybe not the best way to do that, or you're just trying to check things off in another way. Um, r and Studio, there are many different ways you can do these things. Um, and I've just tried to show you some of the different ways that you can do those things. So you've got a few more skills in your tool belt. Um, so you can use them in your own projects and expand other skills as well. So that's all we had for this video. Um, so thank you for viewing this video. There are, will be other videos. Um, check out the other videos if you haven't checked them out yet. Check out the future videos. Um, work through the activities in the book. We haven't done everything in this video that matches up with the book. There's lots more things there. There are activities, there are other examples. Um, and yeah, definitely come to the workshops if you haven't already. Try and book them in again um, next time we run them because they're really useful. It's really good to have a hands-on practical way to learn R because the best way to learn R is by doing R. Um, so thank you very much.